think you're pretty excited if, if you're anything like me after that worship. Didn't our choir just do an incredible job of leading us? Before the throne of grace, you know, ultimately, that, that, is, that is the key of what, what we're doing here uh, when we meet every morning is, is we get ushered in before God's throne where we, uh, where we welcome him to do business with us. And so as we turn to God's word, uh, we're going we're gonna to do exactly that. In, in fact, let's just, let's just open up with a, a word of prayer, all right? W- would you pray along with me and, and just say, our Heavenly Father, would, would you speak to us through your word? It, you, you are the one that, that, that spoke all of eternity into existence. You are our creator and you have drawn near to us that we might know you, that we, we might walk with you. And as we hear this morning a, a testimony of, of a changed life, one who is in utter self-righteousness, but you pursued and you saved and you gave him a new life, God. May you speak to us and may we see and hear and understand the application for our own lives as we read about Saul of Tarsus. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, do me a favor. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, as we're going to continue our walk through the book of Acts. We we are first introduced uh, to... Uh, Saul uh, also will become Apostle Paul, all right? So Saul is his Hebrew name, and Paul is his Greek name. And I'm just going to tell you throughout, I will probably refer to him Paul most of the time, all right? Uh, The text here refers to him as Saul. Luke actually goes back and forth in the book of Acts. There's, uh, there's really no difference. It's just uh, how, how it is, is used. It, it is not really that he has a name change from Saul to Paul. He, he used both, okay? Um, and so forgive me if I just call him Paul the whole time, all right? So we're first introduced to Paul with the stoning of Stephen, right? He is there and he, he gives hearty approval, It's that event, Stephen's death, the persecution in Jerusalem, that burst the bubble of the gospel. No longer contained in Jerusalem, uh, the, the church is forced to flee, and we saw Philip went to Samaria. We saw an incredible revival. We saw the gospel go and the Samaritans get saved. Then we saw uh, Philip called out a way to one Ethiopian eunuch, right? The, The defective, the inadequate, made whole in Jesus. And now this morning we will see the conversion of another one. He's actually on the opposite end of the spectrum from the Ethiopian eunuch because Paul is the self-righteous. He is the hunter of the church, but we will find that he is just as much in need of grace as the rest of us to be found only in Jesus. My dentist growing up was a big game hunter that uh, had a a severely scarred face and right forearm, his hand. And one time I was getting my teeth cleaned and I asked him and he began to tell me a story about how he was on a hunt in Africa and he had been stalking a leopard for miles, hours. They tracked him. Until suddenly the leopard turned in an ambush, leaping up into his jeep, and he threw his right arm up as it began to maul him. You see, the hunted became, sorry, the the hunter became the hunted. As our story opens, Saul is hunting, tracking, stalking the early church with intent to kill and destroy. 
But in the end, we will find that the hunter has actually been hunted himself by King Jesus, but not with the intent to destroy, but rather as God's chosen instrument to save and to bring life. Listen as I read the first two verses out of Acts chapter 9. It says, Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And he went to the high priest and he asked for letters uh, from him to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. You see, Saul was born in Tarsus of Cecilia, sorry, Cilicia, in the home of a rather well-off Pharisees. Saul's parents, they wanted the best for him in education, and so at about the age of 13, they sent him off to Jerusalem, and he would spend the next five or six years studying underneath the prestigious Pharisee Gamaliel. Saul's heart would soon be filled with pride as he rose in prestige and influence, even setting his eyes on one day joining the supreme high court, the Sanhedrin. You see, in one sense, Paul represents the very best in all of us. As a Pharisee, he would have memorized massive chunks, if not the entire Old Testament, fasted twice a week, spent deep hours in prayer. He taught and defended the law. He served in the courts in Jerusalem. And Paul was the best, right? He was the best of the best, excelling above his peers, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees. When Jesus said to the crowd in Matthew 5, 20, that unless your righteousness exceeds that, Of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. That was shocking to the hearer's ears. Exceeds? Surpasses them? They're the absolute best. I mean, they even tithe off of their herb garden. And yet, as we will see, Paul also represents the absolute worst in all of us. You see, for all of his righteousness, it is completely of his flesh. His own self-invented holiness. He's harsh and critical, puffed up with pride, and it actually leads to rot and death. Now, before this morning, before we distance ourselves too much from him, I want you to know that Paul represents the logical end to every one of our self-righteousness. This is where self-righteousness, taken to its end, leads. What C.S. Lewis calls the diabolical self in mere Christianity. Lewis says that, The sins of the flesh are bad, but but they are the least bad of all sins. All the worst pleasures are purely spiritual. The pleasure of putting uh, putting other people in the wrong, of bossing and patronizing and spoiling sport and backbiting. The pleasures of power, of hatred. You see, for there are two things inside of me competing with the human self, which uh, I must try to become. They are the animal self and the diabolical self. And the diabolical self is the worst of the two. It is why a cold, self-righteous prig who goes regularly to church may be far nearer to hell than a prostitute. Lewis describes that our sinful nature has two sides. 
right? The sins of the flesh, and then the other side, which is filled with self-righteousness. A false holiness that is actually us at our very worst because it is polished evil, our smug superiority, reinforcing our divisive preferences and absolutizing our narrow rigidity, as one author puts it. Now, I say this all up front. Before we allow the extreme outpouring of Paul's sins to become so other that we don't see any application for ourselves. You know what's so horrifyingly gripping of this story? That it is the most devout, the most zealous religious people who are studying the truth did not recognize God himself when he showed up. Right? Jesus stood before them and they hated him and primarily for one thing that their self-righteous pride put them at odds with him one because he was not that way he was way too humble and forgiving of sinners and two because he attacked their pride he said that they needed a savior ever bit as much as a prostitute We can imagine that Paul, in his nearness to Jerusalem, at some point heard Jesus teach, was nearby at his crucifixion as Jesus cried out in agony and then prayed for his persecutors. Paul interacted with the apostles who we are told repeatedly we're full of the Holy Spirit right there in the temple courtyard. Paul witnessed a man who, who, who he had passed for decades healed right there in the temple courtyard in Jesus' name. He was perplexed on, on how an angel released the 12 apostles and sent them right back to the temple courtyard. And Paul is right there at Stephen's stoning. And he heard this Holy Spirit prompted sermon. He heard Stephen cry out just like Jesus forgiving his persecutors. And how does Paul's self-righteousness respond when being face-to-face with the Son of God and the Holy Spirit and all of these signs? And he had the preached gospel, the eternal word of life. How does his self-righteousness respond? Hatred. Hatred. He will later say he was furiously enraged. All he saw was red. In Acts 26, 9, he says, I was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And so Jerusalem was not enough, and Judea and Samaria, not enough, and even the northern part of Israel, Galilee, not enough. You see, when our story opens, Paul is headed to Damascus. That is in Syria, 150 miles from Jerusalem, a week-long journey on foot. And he has special orders from the Sanhedrin to expedite, to bring back any Christians that he finds. I mean, talk about an important person, a one-man army. And Paul has been up to this for possibly three years years consumed how many has he arrested caused to flee destroyed families how many has he put to death he is a hunter in relentless pursuit to stamp out the name of Jesus look at verse 3 And as he was traveling, it happened. As he was approaching Damascus, 
And suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. As he approached Damascus, I imagine that his mind raced with his attack plan, mixed with how special that he had become, right? He is the defender of his own elite holiness. The same Paul who would later argue there is none who seeks for God, no, not one, at this moment is fully convinced that he is the shining star of those who seek after God. When suddenly a light so bright that it dimmed the noonday sun, causes him to fall to the ground. 1 Corinthians 15, 8 tells us that he saw the risen Lord. Although those who were with him would not be able to see anyone. Only seeing a light and hearing a voice, but not even being able to understand the voice. Why are you persecuting me? Not them or the church or even my church. It has often been pointed out that from Christ's own point of view, that we are a living part of himself, his very own body. Saul's reply is one of respect. (coughs) Who are you, Lord, is really a title like sir. Who are you, sir? And can you imagine the shock and sudden terror when he hears, I am Jesus. All the air has been sucked out of his lungs. He can hear his own heartbeat. In an instant, he is undone. All the strength and anger, self-righteous pride that he came into town with is now on the ground, crippled simply by the sight of Jesus. He is now weak, blind, impotent, must be led by the hand into the city. Verse 9 tells us that he will not eat or drink for three days. He is utterly exposed. Nowhere to hide his shame because he has been wrong, utterly wrong. All of his efforts at best have been blinded by self-righteousness and at worst are the very hands of the devil himself. For years he scoffed at the absurdity of a dying savior Why would he need such grace? And yet now as he sits in silence, he can hear the screams of families that he drug out into the street. He could hear his own smug laugh. I imagine that Paul still has nightmares over Stephen's death. He hears the cries of his pain along with his voice calling out for forgiveness. You see, Paul couldn't shake it. Where does that sort of otherworldly power come from? Later in Acts, when Paul retells his story to King Agrippa, he adds that Jesus here at this moment says, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, the goads were a prodding stick that you would use to to prod cattle along and forward, and they would have burrs on the ends. And as you push them in the rear, you're driving them forward. What would happen if a, a, a donkey or a cattle at that point kicked against that prodding stick? Well, it would just 
cut his legs up all that much further. Hence the saying, to kick against the goads. Paul himself has been prodded by the Spirit of God, but he has been kicking against the goads, fighting against the very Spirit of God. This scene, this moment, is an alarming foretaste of one that will be repeated billions of times at the final judgment. When any man who tries to stand before the holy creator of the universe in his own righteousness will be exposed, silent, undone, shown scene after scene after scene of their own life where the spirit of God was prompting, trying to draw them to the truth, but they were kicking against the spirit of God. In their own self righteousness. But now remember again with me where we are in the book of Acts that the gospel has gone to the Samaritans, right? Those dirty, false worshiping half breeds. And the gospel went to the eunuch, the defective, the inadequate, who's made whole in Jesus. And now, to the self-righteous, the ultimate self-righteous, right? He's so self-righteous, he murdered the true gospel. And the question for us is, is the good news of Jesus Christ for him? For the overly religious who are caught up in all of their own pride that they come across hateful and full of absolute just self-righteousness? Yes. Yes. Yes, the gospel is for even these. And Jesus is humble enough to pursue him. As Francis Thompson's famous poem calls him, the hound of heaven, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him. Down the arches of the years, I hid from him, and under running laughter, I sped from those strong feet that followed, followed after. And in absolute kindness, King Jesus revealed himself, leaving Paul undone. Finally, poor in spirit and ready for the kingdom of God. See him there in your mind's eye, weak, blind, trembling. This is the beginning of being able to pen years later Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. You see, Paul may be blind, but for the first time he can see spiritually. Verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up 
And go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Um, wait a second. Isn't he here to hunt me? And he saw me in a vision? But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm that he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call upon your name. You know, Jesus doesn't always explain himself. He's actually under no obligation to do so. But here, he understands and he offers Ananias more. But the Lord said to him, go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Ananias, he won't hurt you. I've chosen him to bear my name. A chosen instrument from the foundation of the world. To proclaim the name of Jesus before kings and governors and the Sanhedrin. And the masses, both Jews and Gentiles. Now think about the absolute magnificence of this statement. Paul will declare the name of Jesus everywhere he goes. Now, on one hand, Paul is an excellent choice. He's brilliant. He's highly educated. He's a Roman citizen and a Jew. He's well-traveled. But on the other hand, he's hunting the church. He hates the name of Jesus. Why? Because he does not understand the nature of such a humble God who would suffer in order to save. And Jesus says, I will teach him about my upside-down economy, that it will be through his suffering that I will advance my kingdom. You must understand here, when Jesus makes the statement, he will suffer, it, it is not one of vengeance, okay? Jesus is not saying, I'm going to get him, all right, because I really don't forgive him, all right, and so he's going to have to suffer in order to earn my salvation. Guys, that's not it at all. But rather, catch this, Jesus in his infinite wisdom says, you know who I'm going to pick to show the world my upside down economy? That I am a God who enters into suffering. That guy. The one who least understands it. I'm going to use that guy to show the world my character. Verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And after laying hands on him said, Brother Saul. What incredible words right there. Brother Saul. With immediate obedience and immediate acceptance. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. You ever ask the question, why did God use Ananias? I mean, the resurrected Lord, okay, left heaven and appeared to Paul on the deserted road. And then he calls Ananias three days later, hey, go lay hands on him. This too is a magnificent picture. Ananias, whose name means God is gracious, is most likely a pastor in the church there in Damascus. 
How many have fled to his city? Because it's a bustling city for safe haven. How many has Ananias had to pastorally care for? Because their lives have been upended by this very man. But if he is a sinner saved by grace, then he enters through the same door and is welcome in the same assembly as every one of us. You see, Christ uses Ananias because he's connecting Paul to the local body of believers. Remember where just a few moments ago we left Paul. Blind, weak, exposed. He hasn't had food or drink for three days. His mind has been racing about the depth of his own sin. He hears those voices, they replay over and over again. How does it feel when he is washed in the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes inside of him? What a magnificent moment. And immediately, there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he regained his sight and he got up and he was baptized. And he took food and he was strengthened. You see, a physical reality to explain the spiritual. I was once blind, but now I see. Paul will spend the rest of his days preaching and teaching and writing trying to explain this new holiness that he has found, a gift of God's grace, not earned in all of his own fleshly striving, but simply by God's grace, a holiness that comes from knowing Jesus, a holiness of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus' holiness is life-giving, and it is desirable in every way. His holiness is serious enough to warn and light enough to laugh. It's firm, and yet it's also freeing. Jesus' kind of holiness has no pride at all. It isn't pushy or harsh. Jesus really is gentle and lowly, embracing all who humble themselves before him. And Paul will gladly exchange all of the prestige that is attached to his heritage and his education and all of his positions. He considers it all rubbish that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And he will give witness to his Savior. And it will lead to much suffering. That he who heartily approved at Stephen's stoning will himself be stoned. He who pursued Christ's followers will himself be pursued and run out of towns. He who threw them in jail will himself be thrown in jail. And he who cast his lot to end believers' lives will freely give his own life rather than deny his Savior. He who persecuted the name of Jesus Christ out of hatred and rage will change the world fueled by love and mercy and faith in the good news of that same name. Paul will be beaten, stoned, imprisoned, shipwrecked, abandoned, and eventually martyred, possibly suffering 
Okay? The most that anyone besides Christ has ever suffered. And through it all, he will write, I will not be put to shame in anything. Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we have heard your testimony and your moving, your calling of your servant, who is the most self-righteous. Father, we do confess how often our own self-righteousness creeps up. and separates us from you. How often we puff out our chest in our own religious practices, staring down at others, and are overly harsh and critical. And yet we've seen this morning from your word that your gospel is for us too. The chief of sinners. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name, if there's anyone here that has continually run from you because they've been too prideful to stop and kneel at the foot of the cross, I pray. And Paul's testimony would capture them. And I pray that us as a church family would be anything but self-righteous. as we want to be your hands and your feet to a lost and dying world. There's probably nothing more off-putting than self-righteousness. So we welcome you, Father, to convict us, to even expose us. Because, Father, when you convict you heal at the same time. In Jesus' name we pray.